before we even begin the homily, a few points of clarification. The, the images of darkness and light, good. They're from Paul's letter to the Thessalonians. Light being promise and hope, just think of the dawn of creation. Another phrase I want to comment on are, is the phrase that comes to us from the book of Proverbs, fear of the Lord. It, it doesn't mean fear, like watching a scary movie. Fear of the Lord in this context, and in the context of, of the scriptures, is not like what the servants had toward the master, that kind of fear, because he was an ogre. No, fear of the Lord is awe. Don't know why they don't translate it that way, but that's, that's the phrase, awe. Awe means, wow, wake up this morning, look outside, even amid the pandemic, look how beautiful. The day is awesome. That's awe. So God expects us to live in awe of him. He made us. He's, cre he's a creator. So living with awe, fear of the Lord, is appropriate. Um, the last book of the book of Proverbs deals with what we heard about the wife as a worthy person. Uh, this is not demeaning women or men and putting them in significant positions of authority or hierarchy. Uh, it means that every one of us has a talent. So the book of Proverbs is filled with these, uh, you might say, phrases, uh, little comments, little uh, insights, the whole book. This is the last chapter. And this one goes to, right to the family, uh, in, in a level of respect, okay? Respecting each other. Everybody has their roles. Everybody has their roles. And if you do your role right, correctly, you should be held in esteem by the family. And he com concludes that section, um, you'll be praised at the city gates. That's important because the city gates are where the wise men, the elders of the community sat, and people would bring them their problems, their, their insight for a particular decision, and so on. So it's significant that we look at this worthy wife as a member of a family that respects God and hold, holds God in awe. And even although she's as worthy as a set of pearls, she's also charitable. Again, another important characteristics of a, characteristic of a family, to, to give to the needy and extend ourselves to the poor. Okay, that's the, you haven't even started the commentary, I mean the homily yet. Now we'll get into the homily. Tell me your, res, your response. Now, the talents that we're talking about are sums of money. Interesting how the word has become significant, like, like uh, something we have within us, a talent. A talent is a, wor um, a sum of money, and for great emphasis, Jesus talks about the number of talents, the five, the ten, the one. Um, each talent is like a million dollars in today's equivalent. So Jesus is talking about a very exaggerated sum that he gives in charge of his servants. The guy must have been really rich, but it's a parable. Don't forget, it's not history. This is not authentic. Jesus is saying, I want you to think about this. God has given so many talents to all of us. And now I want to go into the concept of darkness and the concept of burying. Paul's letter to the Thessalonians encourages us to live life as if we are members of the light as if we are, and we are indeed, people who were saved by Jesus Christ. Positive, optimistic, people who hold God in a great relationship of awe. There are people in our society who don't believe that. There are people in our society who have talents, and let's put the word talent aside, and let's substitute self-esteem. People in our society who have self-esteem that they don't know about. Low self-esteem. Low caring of themselves. Deprecating themselves all the time. Putting themselves down. And I, I have to say, as a family therapist, the mother was the problem. No, not, not really. That's Freud. But family is the problem. When a child grows up not connected to his parents, 
not connected in a way that is awesome. Now, the kid doesn't have to be put on a pedestal, but the kid has to be a member of the family, the same family we're talking about from the book of Proverbs. Respected, held in awe, held in respect, and loved. And the kid has to know that love. He has to know it sometimes by parents who are affectionate and tell them, sometimes by parents who hug them and kiss them and do all sorts of goofy things with the kid out of love, and sometimes just on, on a day-to-day -day basis. The kid has to know he's loved. He has to know he's attached to this family because that attachment goes with him through life. And when we meet people that look down upon themselves, forget looking down upon other people, we know, inevitably, it started at home. Now, are the, are the parents bad for doing this? No. As, as they say, kids don't come with little books on how to handle them, but there's plenty of literature online. If you, don't have, if you don't have the literature, go for it and study what it means to be a parent in the 21st century. Okay, so we're looking at raising children, but we're also looking at ourselves with this scriptures today. The talents that every one of us has is, is enormous. And when I figure that you are more important than me, I'm not doing you or me any favor. I'm not honoring you. I'm disrespecting you. Because if I put myself down because you are rich, good looking, the right size, right name, all that stuff, I'm not regarding you as a person created in the image of God. I'm regarding you as the devil. I'm regarding you as someone above me, in control of me. And that begins the level of lack of self-esteem in our families. That's why it's so important to begin it there, where every kid has a value. You don't get a, a reward for everything. You, you, you don't get a, a prize for everything. You are respected for everything, whether you come in first or come in last. You're respected. That builds self-esteem. But when that kid grows up and becomes a member of our society, and he or she is not sure of his worth, what is he going to do? He's going to bury it. He's going to bury it. How does he bury it? Well, there's more than one way. Drugs are up there. Drugs are up there high. Because for that momentary high, speaking of high, that, that momentary high that person is accomplished. He's big. She's, she's, she's important. Reality, look in the mirror. A person who is really hooked on drugs and addicted so desperately on drugs, really, they, they don't think much of themselves. They're continuing the downward spiral of lacking self-esteem, of burying any remnant of self-esteem. It's a great substitute for a mother or a father. No, it's not going for drugs, and physiologically, it satisfies something in the person, temporarily we know, that makes him or her feel important, feel superior, and gives them a sense of grandiosity. But you and I know it's false. Because the authentic person, even if he says, well, I have no talent, you don't have to have talent to live. You are a person. Someone called me up the other day. Interesting. As a family therapist, I hear a lot of stuff. People say, how can you, how can you give advice as a priest to family therapists? Hey, I've got history, and I came from a family. A wacko family, but a loving family nevertheless. So I, I know all the ins and outs, and I studied. The woman called up and set an appointment up, and she had one last question. First time it ever happened. Are you willing to work with people of color? My response was, y you're a person. I, how that person has been challenged in her life to think because she's a person of color, she has less worth than anybody else I would work with. You see where self-esteem also comes, lack of self-esteem also comes from? Society, jealousy, putting people down, 
Because if I feel good about myself, I can, and, and you, you're like good, you're up there, I have to put you down to, to make you equal to me or push you down even further so I can feel superior. That's burying your talents. That's burying your knowledge of God. That's burying your faith. There are so many ways people put themselves down and bury their self-esteem. Escapism is, is a great example. Escaping from responsibility, escaping from, from reality. And God, in Jesus Christ, is giving us this example in a parable, nevertheless, a parable that I'm giving you millions of valuable self-esteem traits. Even if you have one, use it. Knock your socks off. I mean, God is your father. I mean, say it again. God is your father. Say your father was an alcoholic. Say your mother was not a good person. We could stay there. We could stay there in that very dysfunctional family. Or realizing through faith and prayer that God is my father. And he has given me talents galore, love galore. He's given me the entire world. I can honestly say I deserve it because he made me. He put me in this world. And sometimes a person grows up in a really screwed up family. Okay, we can't blame them. Sometimes we do in therapy, but usually blame is not the issue. We can point out the weak traits of a family and the origins of the family dysfunction. We can do that, yes. But the person who's the identified person, who's looking at him or herself in light of the family, has to realize that over and above the family, God is his father or her father. And that gives every one of us an enormous sense of self-esteem. Or it should, if we let it sink in. To show the value of humanity, to show the value of each one of us, See, there's no accidents with God. As we uncover more and more that we know about him, we, the revelations are unbelievable. God, the creator of everything that is the furthest universe you can imagine, everything, every blade of grass, every drop of water, every planet out there, God becomes man, becomes a human being. What more do we want from God to assure ourselves of his love and respect for us what he does for us he does for his own son he loves you he wants each one of us to love each other forget the the, the societal criteria whether it's economic social ethnic that come on that's nonsense. If we value ourselves on somebody else's criteria, we are valued on God's criteria. Every one of us, whether we're disabled, whether we're intelligent, whether we're a professor, whether a three-year-old kid, it doesn't matter. We're made in God's image. And he has given us value. Liturgically, we're winding down in this year. We're coming to an end. Next week, we'll be celebrating the Feast of Christ the King, the summation of the year. And traditionally, we always say, I always say, if Jesus doesn't come back on the Feast of Christ the King that night, we start all over from the beginning. Because the idea is it's the summation, it's the Alpha and Omega coming to the point of creation. So we're close to the end of the liturgical year. But we might be close to the end of our lives, doesn't matter. Or we might be close to the end of the world. Again, it doesn't matter. We who are believers, who respect the gift of life that God has given us and accept the self-esteem with which he's blessed us. We're ready. We're ready to go. As Paul says, we can be caught up in the clouds with the angels at the sound of a trumpet. Uh, we're ready. We're ready. If we accept ourselves and work with who we are. Love not, not selfishly, we're not talking about narcissism, but love each of us, ourselves. Respect. 
And please, don't think, oh, he has something more than I do. He's better than me. That's all baloney. God made him, her, me, same way. We got into the world the same way. Where we landed in the world, different. Sometimes good, sometimes bad circumstances. But each one of us, nevertheless, is valuable to God. He holds every one of us in his hand. He wants to hear from us. He, he's asking us to speak to him. Speak to him like a daddy. L like, what's that baby's name? Neil? Yeah. Mia. Mia is on her mommy's lap. And Mia is sucking a little nipple there. And she's hugged by her mom. Look at her. That's how God the Father de teaches and deals with every one of us. He wants his hands around us. He wants to hear from us. He wants us to rely on him. He wants us to trust him. Sometimes we can do that very intimately in prayer. We do it here in the Eucharist every time we gather. Sometimes we need to have that, that physical reality that God is hugging me and loves me like I love my children, like I love my parents. And no, we don't hold God before us in fear. We hold God before us in awesomeness. The kids say that a lot. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, we know. God is awesome. 